Um, I see these 18 people. Okay, cool. So, let's get to it. Good morning, everyone. I am Samantha Lee. I'm from the Policy and Research Directorate. Um, and I just want to extend my thank you for joining us in today's session. We will be exploring the importance of having a will and uh, the complications of dying in the state. So the initiative was brought about by National Wills Week, which is the 13th to the 17th of September. But the department, um, they're ramping up the efforts to uh, have awareness with regard to wills. Uh, and we are reaching out to our DHS family. Um, and that's why we're having today's session. So it will be presented by Lisa from the Transactional Support Centre. Um, and in terms of today's logistics, we will be having Lisa provide us an overview of the importance of having a will um, and then learning from the real case, cases that was worked on by the TSC about the problems that can arise if no will, if there is no will when somebody passes. And after that, we'll have our question and answer session. So if you have anything that's burning that came up um, within what Lisa was saying, please do take note of it and then you will be able to engage with them during that session. So please note that the session will be recorded and that with the permission of the TSC, uh, resources will be sent out to the attendees after the meeting. So Lisa, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Samantha, and thanks for the invite. We're very happy to be here to share some of our, our knowledge that we've uh, learned along the way. Um, I'm going to try and just share my screen and see what happens. Do, 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 do. Give me a second. No, I'm having a gremlin again. Jess, do you want to try and share? Sure, no problem. Thank you. All right, just while we wait for that, um, I'm happy to give a little bit of back, quick background on the Transaction Support Centre. I don't know if any, everybody is familiar with who we are and the work we're doing, or if I should just give a, a two-minute blurb on that. I think that would be helpful, Liz. Okay. Uh, yeah, please do. Okay, great. So the Transaction Support Centre um, was set up about three years ago um, by 71.4, which is a research consultancy, and by the Centre for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa, which is a, a sort of a think tank for um, access to housing finance throughout Africa. And the initiative was started um, actually initially to facilitate subsidy applications in the lower income markets. Um, but it has since over the last three years, thank you, Jess, over the last three years, morphed into a general property advice center for all sorts of um, title deed issues, um, helping all sorts of um, homeowners regularize ownership. Um, so we were initially set up with a physical office in Makaza. Um, Jess, I think you can skip on to the next slide, which shows where we were, um, right there in the center of Makaza. Um, but as a result of lockdown, um, we've decided to since work remotely, um, but we're still continuing the work that we're doing. Yes, you can move on. So I just want to check quickly that I'm um, when I am in presenter mode, are you guys seeing the uh, presentation, the presenter view or the slideshow? The slideshow. OK, great. Yeah, that's fine. So basically how the TSC works, if you start at the bottom, we onboard our day to day operational work is we onboard new clients. We have a look at what their issues are um, and then we what will be document their cases and we interact with um, both public and private sector to, to sort of um, resolve some of the, the problems in the processes that clients are facing. Upper level, we basically look at trying to optimize municipal and provincial processes to resolve title deed issues, as well as looking at uh, engaging with private sector. So it can be lenders, it can be conveyances, um, other kind of service providers that can also assist in that process. And then right up at the top, we sort of look at 
key bottlenecks, key um, problems in processes, policies, things like that, and look at how we can basically find solutions to that and then scale that up on a broader scale. Yes, you can move on. Okay, so just very briefly, um, as at June of this year, we had had a total of just over 1,300 cases um, over the last three years. Almost roughly half of those were clients that walked in the door, and the other half were um, surveys that we conducted of a specified area in Makaza, actually three specified areas in Makaza, um, and that the nature of that work was basically occupancy survey for the city of Cape Town um, on the primary transfer backlog. So if we look at those 13, roughly 1300 um, cases, you can see there that the subsidy application, that little wedge in yellow, which is what we were initially set up to do, is a really minuscule part of the work, only 28 cases out of the the 1300. The vast majority are title deed problems, just over 1100. And then there are a couple of other things. Some people came to us for wills, some people came to us because they wanted to buy a house, some people wanted to sell their houses, but really the bulk of it, um, title deed problems. And then if we just look across on the right, the nature of those title deed problems, um, Oh, I'm just struggling to see here. Yeah, the vast majority, the primary transfer backlog, and then split fairly equally between informal cash sales. We know that in this market, people transact informally. They don't like to transact through the deeds office for various reasons. It's expensive. It, it takes a long time. Deceased estates, um, also a big component of our work there. Um, and then just various other administrative uh, issues. What's interesting, just seeing as today's topic is about wills and the importance of having a will, is if we look at that pie on the left, only 38 people out of 1,300 came to us for a will, which is obviously a minute proportion. Okay, so let's um, talk about the importance of having a will. Um, it's estimated that only about 30% of adults in South Africa have a valid will, which is really a very small portion. Um, and I think historically in, in the lower um, income markets with properties at lower values, um, it perhaps hasn't been as important to have a will, but we've seen that, you know, that the value of RDP houses has increased drastically um, and that those assets are actually becoming fairly valuable assets in estates. Um, and we've done quite a lot of work last week during Wills Week just to get the message out about the importance of a will and why it's so important. Um, in a nutshell, there are three main reasons, I would say, why, what happens if you die without a will. The first is that it can be very costly trying to wind up an estate if you've died without a will. And we'll look in, in one of the case studies a little bit later what kind of, of, of increased costs we're talking about. The second problem is that it can cause long delays. The process, if you have a will and you go to the master with your will, or the, your family after your passing goes to the master with your will, the process is a lot simpler, it's a lot quicker than if you don't have a will. If you have, don't have a will, it's all sorts of um, tapping around in trying to prove who your heirs are and resolving disputes among heirs, et cetera, et cetera. So the process is just very, you know, that much longer. And then probably the most important one that we're going to touch on today in our case studies is that without a will, there is a, a vast mismatch between the intended wishes of the deceased as to what they wanted, who they wanted to inherit their estate, um, cultural notions of inheritance. So we know, for example, in the African population, there's historically a, um, a system of succession which recognizes the eldest male. Um, uh, versus what the South African law, the formal law of succession says. So those two, th three things are vastly different and the consequences um, of not having a will really lie in this, in this third area. Jess, I think you can move on. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to look at five or six case studies today um, based on real life examples that we at the TSC have seen and that we are either have resolved or are in the process of trying to resolve. We're going to look at the cohabiting partner, the customary spouse, a parent who marries, the appearance of estranged or unscrupulous heirs, and lastly, um, 
where the air is a minor. Okay, so the first one we're gonna look at is the cohabiting partner. Um, I'm gonna talk you through the case study and then we're gonna have a look at, at what the problems are uh, for this particular client. So Mr. B approached us to assist with the primary transfer of a government subsidized property in Google Air 2. So he says he was given the property in 2002 by government with, uh, at the time, a, a lady who was then his long-term partner. She has subsequently deceased. He still lives in the property. Um, when we did some background checks on whether this person is actually entitled to, uh, to the property as a, as a beneficiary, we found that on HSS, the deceased uh, cohabiting partner was in fact the approved beneficiary. And she had been approved on the basis of single with dependents rather than on the basis of cohabiting. Um, Mr. B himself is not an approved beneficiary. He's not an approved dependent. Um, in fact, we, we can find no records for him on HSS. So what, what will happen in this particular case, we, we've had some, we've had a fair amount of, of cooperation from the city of Cape Town in agreeing that where a beneficiary has passed away, um, it's not necessarily fair to the heirs that they are deprived of the property be, as a result of the of the state's, um, you know, failure to, to timely transfer that property. If the state had transferred the property, say, on, on date of occupation or shortly thereafter, um, that would actually be a registered property in the deceased's name and the heirs would, it would form part of the estate and the, and the heirs would be entitled to, to claim that property. But of course, with the property not having yet been registered on the state, um, it places the heirs in a, in a precarious position. But the city, we've had lots of negotiations with the city and they've basically agreed, it's fine, we will transfer to the estate itself and then you can assist in the on distribution of that from the estate to the various heirs. So in this instance, we could have a situation where the city says that's fine, we will, we will transfer to a state late deceased. The problem for Mr. B is that they weren't married. And I think a lot of people assume that if you live with someone for 15 or 20 years, you have the same rights or virtually the same rights as had you been married. And unfortunately in the law, that is not the case at all. So although he's been living in that property for 20 years, and although he lived with the deceased as, his, as her, her long-term partner for virtually all that time, um, he actually has no intestate rights at all. So what will happen in this case is that um, the, the valid heirs of the deceased are the people who are actually entitled to the property. So, you know, had she done a will before she passed away to say, you know, this is my long term partner and this is the person who I think should get the property when I pass on, it would have been a very simple scenario. And instead, Mr. B is left with nothing. Okay, Jess, we can move on to the next one. Okay, and a very similar scenario is that of the customary spouse. So again, um, I think the assumption from a lot of people is that one's rights as a customary spouse are identical to one's rights as a civil spouse. Um, and if you have a look at that little box I've put at the bottom there, there's been fairly recent, when I say fairly recent, not as, you know, much more recent than this particular case, which dates back to the 90s. But there is now legislation which says that you're supposed to register your customary marriage. So you're supposed to go along to home affairs with a labola letter with two witnesses from each side of the family um, or some other kind of proof from the family that they accept the marriage and, and recognize the marriage. And you're actually supposed to go and register your, your customary marriage at home affairs. And the reason for this is that there is then a proof, there's some sort of proof of that customary marriage. And obviously that proof is needed for all sorts of things, one of which is intestate succession. So in this particular case, we had Mrs. X, she came to see us, she claims that she was married by customary rights to Mr. M. And Mr. M got a property, a government subsidized property in Kailicha in 1992. Um, she claims they were married around that same time in the property. 
not valued very high at about 76,000 Rand, but still an asset. Um, Mr. M passed away already in 1999, and Mrs. X has never done anything about that. She's never reported his estate. Um, she's never tried to secure transfer of the property to herself, but she's now, that, that's something she's trying to do now. And her customary marriage was never registered. So if we have a look at what that means for her now, <clears throat> So if she can't prove her marriage, or if say, for example, her husband's family decide, maybe they know full well that the customary marriage was a valid one recognized by all members of the family, but they decide, well, actually, we don't feel like cooperating in registering the marriage or helping her to register the marriage. Um, we actually want that property for ourselves. Um, as a customary spouse who cannot prove her marriage, she, she won't get anywhere with um, intestate succession. So the law of intestate succession, very briefly, without going into all the details, says that the surviving spouse does have first bite at the cherry. So they are the main um, intestate, intestate heir, if I can put it that way. Um, but without, you know, being able to prove her marriage and without the cooperation of her husband's family, also the fact that her, her marriage dates back to the early 90s, there's a very real likelihood that, um, you know, that the people who were witness to the marriage are, are subsequently deceased. Um, so she will have a very hard time trying to prove that. And the chances are that she, unless the family cooperates, she won't get anywhere. Okay, the next example is, is probably our most complex, one of our most complicated cases to date. Um, and let's talk through it uh, very slowly. It does, it does get a little bit complicated, but it's the example where somebody's parent marries or remarries. So this lady P came to see us. She was the only child of a single mother and that single mother got a government subsidized house in Kailicha many, many years ago. Um, and P lived there with her mother, basically for her whole life, just the two of them. Then um, living in the house next door was Mr. M, um, also single, who he himself had, had uh, received the government subsidized house next door. And the two uh, started a romance and they eventually got married. So now we have, and they actually had a child together. So now we have P and her mother living in one um, RDP house and next door to them, Mr. M, um, who subsequently married P's mother and there is another child, so P's half brother. Um, P's mother then passed away in 2018 and shortly thereafter, Mr. M also passed away um, and neither of them left a will. So now we have P living in what was her mother's house and the half brother living in what was the father's house. And both of them assumed, and I think this was probably the discussion in the family before the, the parents passed away, is that it would be obvious that P would keep what was her mother's house before her marriage and that the half brother would keep what was his father's house before the marriage. Um, you know, there's two siblings, two houses, that seems like the most fair approach. But unfortunately, the law says something very, very different. So when the two um, adults got married, which was a mar civil marriage in community of property, both of those properties automatically became assets in the joint estate. So remember when we married in community, there are no separate estates, there's one joint estate, and both those properties fell into the joint estate. And what we then need to look at is how we deal with those estates. First, P's mother's estate, because she passed away first, and then we will move on to Mr. M's estate. So P's mother died first, so we need to look at her estate. Her valid heirs are P, her, her first child, P's half-brother, which is the mother's second child, as well as Mr. M as the surviving spouse. So we have three heirs in the mother's estate rather than just P. So let's have a look at the detail of the estate. So P's mother's house was valued at 244,000, that's a municipal valuation, and Mr. M's house was valued at 382. So bearing in mind what we've said about them both falling into the joint estate, 
the joint estate value is 626,000, which means each spouse's share is 313. So apart from the complications of, of the fact that the estate is valued over the 250,000 Rand threshold, um, which, which is a more costly uh, exercise for the heirs to, to go through, the point is that if P's mother had had a will, she could have left the property to P, which I think was probably the entire family's intention, and P would then have inherited a property worth 244,000. However, the moment her mother died without a will, and bearing in mind at this stage that the husband was still alive, as the surviving spouse, he gets the first 250,000 of his spouse's estate. So that is what the law says, which means if we look at that value, P's mother's estate was worth 313, Mr. M gets the first 250, which means there's only 63,000 rand of value in the estate left. Um, and the law says, well, that must be divided between the, the children. So P and her half brother would essentially really get 31 and a half thousand rand each in the mother's estate. So you can just see there in a snapshot, the vastly different situation for P had her mother had a will and without, you know, without a will. She basically ends up with 31,000 compared to, to a property worth 244. So if we move on to the outcome, this little uh, blurb on the right hand side, um, we now need to look at the fact that the father then passed away. Um, so we look at his estate. Remember, he now has his original estate of 313 plus his 250,000 that he inherited from his, his deceased spouse. Now, remember that P is not Mr. M's biological daughter. Mr. M passes away, he no longer has a spouse, and his only biological child is the half-brother, which means the half-brother is his only valid heir. So the brother will inherit essentially the entire property that is left in his father's name, which is his father's house, as well as the bulk of, of what was the mother's house. So the important learning here is that children of a deceased um, will always fall in line after the surviving spouse. And this can be very problematic, as we can see in P's case. You know, the family all had one idea in mind. Um, it was fairly obvious. There were two properties. Why shouldn't everybody benefit? But the reality is that P really walks away with 30,000 Rand and the brother gets everything else. Okay, when I talked about just very briefly in the beginning about the, the sort of the cost implications of dying without a will and the length of time that these things can take. Um, what it now means is that had P's mother done a will, there would have been one transfer. It would have gone from P's mother to P. So if you can just go back a slide, Jess, thank you. It would have gone, the, the estate, that well, the, the conveyancing processes would have gone, transferred from P's mother to P, one transaction, one set of conveyancing costs. In reality, in order to unwind this mess now, in other words, P's mother to P's father, P's mother to Mr. M, portion to the children, Mr. M's estate then to his son, there are three or four or five conveyancing transactions that need to happen, all of which have a cost. Um, if you're looking at five transfers, I mean, you're looking well in excess of, of 50,000 Rand, which really for P is just unaffordable. Um, the fortunate thing for P in this, in this case is that the brother is, is, a, is a nice guy and he is prepared to cooperate. And so what, will, what, what we've agreed he will do is that we will unwind all of this mess. We will transfer the mother's property to the father. We will turn all to the father's estate. We will divide a little bit up to the children. We will follow this correct sequence, which is for the mother's property, of the father's property to first go to the son. And then the son will have to donate that property to his half sister. That is really the only way um, we will end up with the result which everybody envisaged. And that donation transfer at the end, so that's yet another set of conveyancing costs, 
Um, bearing in mind for each of these transfers that has to happen, these five or six transfers, there's rates clearance required, which obviously carries a cost. Um, but the, the last portion, the donation, um, could potentially also attract donations tax, which is another cost. You know, any time you donate more than 100,000 rand, SARS is going to look at it and, and see if, if it would like to levy some donations tax. Um, which is probably another prohibitive cost that, that most people, you know, in this sort of income bracket are unable to afford. Um, but as I say, luckily, Peace Brothers, Half Brothers, is going to cooperate and she will, touch wood, end up with the property just with a, a hell of a lot of processes and a hell of a lot of costs. Okay. All right, the second example of a parent who marries is a little bit more, sim is a little bit simpler. Um, so I'll just talk through it fairly quickly. In this case, W was the only child of her parents. They were married in community and they, as a married couple, were given a, an RDP house in Kailicha in the 90s. And the family had lived there ever since. Uh, W's father left them many, many years ago and she and her mother continued to live in the property. The parents never formally divorced. Um, which is another, you know, it's, it's ancillary to the discussion around wills, but it's another um, danger in, in, you know, if, you, if your partner leaves you and many, many years later, you, he hasn't come back, you should perhaps go ahead and divorce him. Because what happened here was her mother passed away, she remained in the house, and her father then passed away. But before his death, he had married somebody else and he had had two further children with that, with that lady. So W assumed that because she lived in that property her entire life and because in her mind, the father had essentially abandoned them to start another family, she assumed that, that the property would be hers. But again, the law says something very, very different. So as we've already seen um, in the example of P, the previous example, the moment um, W's father remarried um, in community of property, that property became an asset in his joint estate. So remember, W's mother passed away first without a will, which meant that even though she was no longer, um, even though she hadn't divorced the father, she was still legally married to him, which means although they'd been estranged for years, he was her intestate heir as the surviving spouse. So the property would have gone to him. And then the moment he married his, his second wife, that property would have formed, formed an asset in the joint estate um, and become basically both of those spouses' property. Then W's father passes away, and we need to look at who his heirs are. And he has, he has basically four heirs, his new spouse, W, as his first child, and then these two half-siblings of W. So the property value here is really, really low. Um, I forget, but I think it's in the 70s, 70, 70,000, somewhere around there. Um, so basically, 76,000, I think, yeah, the wife, um, as we've seen in the previous example, the spouse gets the first 250,000, which means the second wife will essentially inherit the property. And W, it's the only home she's ever known. Um, her father hasn't even raised her. And now she will be basically left homeless. Okay. So let's just have a look at an example of had, you know, had her mother had a will, she would at least have been able to inherit her mother's half share in the property. Okay, had her mother actually taken proper steps to get divorced, um, you know, that might have been a different story. She might have ended up with the entire property. But let's just say she would at least have inherited her mother's half share. Without a will, when W's father was still alive, remember W's father is the surviving spouse. So he gets everything. She ends up with nothing. And as we've already said, the moment he dies, his new wife is the surviving spouse and she gets everything. So W is basically left with nothing. <clears throat> okay, Jess, we can move on. Okay, I just want you as an aside, just have a look here at the, an interesting um, benefit of having a will. Um, do you, talking about marriages and how that can cause consequences that one didn't envisage. So 
this is an example where the heir actually marries or has married at some point. And this is an example of how a will can actually be really useful. So in this case, Mrs. H um, was the registered owner of a property in Kailicha valued at 386,000, so a sizable asset. And before she died, she, she had done a will and she wanted the property to go to her son. She was very worried. I don't know, you know, what sort of behavior her son got up to, but I think she was very worried about who her son might end up marrying. Um, and as we've seen in the examples above, the moment somebody marries, um, it can have terrible consequences for his or her children and other heirs. And I think she was worried that once he married, um, that any spouse that he had could essentially end up with the property over and above any children of her son. And she was quite adamant that she wanted this property to, to stay in the family and to go down the line to her son, her son's children, etc. So she included a specific provision in her will, which is actually a very common, it's a very standard uh, provision. Uh, we certainly put it in all of our wills that we do for our clients which basically says that any benefit which any beneficiary gets in terms of the will is specifically excluded from the legal consequences of any marriages in community. So what that means is if we look at the, if we look at the um, example above, basically, um, no matter what the son does, no matter who he marries, um, customary, civil, no matter what he does, um, any marriage in community that is, or that is deemed to be in community will basically be excluded. Meaning that a spouse can never come in and say, I'm the surviving spouse, I'm entitled to inherit, um, which will protect the children down the line. So that is a very useful provision to put in the world. Okay, the next example we're gonna look at, and this is probably the bulk or maybe not the bulk, but a, a, certainly a big portion of our deceased estate cases is basically where there are disputes in the family, um, estranged heirs pop up or sort of unscrupulous heirs um, pop up and basically complicate things. So our first case here was Mrs. D and she was the registered owner of a property also in Kylie to worth about 250,000 Rand. And she initially approached the TSC because she wanted to donate the property to her grandson. I say grandson in inverted commas because as we'll see later, he wasn't actually her, her blood relative, but she, she saw him as her grandson. And at the time, and bearing in mind, you know, how sometimes these processes can take a while, we tried to encourage her to do a will in the meantime. So that while we sorted out the donation, there was at least a valid will, but she was reluctant to do so. So we went, uh, went ahead with preparing the donation transfer, but unfortunately before that happened, she passed away. So her situation was she wasn't married, so there was no surviving spouse. She had one biological child, a son, and two adopted children. Again, I put it in inverted commas because they weren't formally adopted. Um, by her, but she, she raised them. And this grandson that she wanted to leave the property to was the son of one of these adopted daughters. Um, so also not a blood relative, but somebody that she considered to be, to be as good as a blood relative. Um, she had actually been estranged from her biological son for many, many years. Um, she had no intention of ever leaving him any of her, certainly not the property or anything else. Um, and she was adamant that these two, you know, these two daughters that she had raised were the ones who should benefit from her estate and particularly this grandson. Now, the law of interstate succession is very clear. It basically, um, when you look at children, it only looks at blood children, so your biological children or your formerly adopted children. So none, you know, it can't be uh, stepchildren unless you formally adopted them. It can't be this kind of scenario of Mrs. D where she's just taken them in and raised them as her own. So unfortunately in this case, the only, there is only one valid intestate heir. She, remember she's got no surviving spouse and she's only got the one child, the estranged son. 
And so he's the only invalid intestate heir. He's been nowhere for years. He's now popped out of the woodwork and he has now said, I'm actually the intestate heir and I want to um, claim the property, which he's completely entitled to do. Um, you know, had she had a will, none of that would have happened. And even though she had a signed donation agreement, you know, which was cl a clear intention of, of what she wanted to happen to that property, unfortunately, the donation agreement doesn't meet the requirements um, for a valid, a valid will. Those requirements are quite specific. And so even though, you know, she had made her intentions clear on paper, it's unfortunately just not good enough. So basically this grandson uh, inherits nothing and the property would go to the estranged biological child. Okay, the last case study I want to talk through is the minor heir. And this, um, as we know, happens a lot um, in the lower income areas. We do have a lot of, um, you know, property owners who pass away leaving minor children. So Mrs. S uh, was the registered owner of a property in Kailicha with about 90,000. At the time that she passed away in 2000, she was a widow, so her spouse had already passed away, and she had three children. Those three children would be her valid intestate heirs. They were all, um, interestingly enough, a grown up at the time. Um, so sibling A was married to somebody else and was not interested in the property. She was perfectly happy to renounce her inheritance, um, willing to cooperate. Sibling B had actually passed away um, and he himself had had one child. We'll, we'll come back to, to how the law looks at, at how in succession goes down the line. That child's still a minor. And then we had sibling C, which is the, the client of the TSC, who had come to us to try to, to secure transfer of the property into her name. Um, basically, amongst the family, they had agreed that that was the obvious thing to do. Sibling A was living elsewhere with a husband. Sibling B was deceased. Sibling C, in their minds, was the only one who was left. The property should go to her. But that's not what the law says. Again, um, we have to look at how interstate, interstate succession works. And what the law says is that if somebody has already passed away, so sibling B passed away, his share of the property must go down the line to his descendants, so to his children. Um, now, of course, we know that he only had one child and that child is still a minor. A minor child, there, there are two complications with a minor as an heir. The first one um, is that a minor has no, no real contractual capacity. So a minor, the minor cannot come along and, say, and sign the transfer documents. Um, or do any of the kind of contractual stuff that's necessary to, to take transfer of that property. Um, what would have to happen is that somebody in the family would need to apply to have a, a formal guardian appointed for that child. Um, if that child's mother is still alive, the mother can, can is his um, guardian in law. But let's say the mother is not. Somebody would have to come and apply to the high court. It's a very expensive process. Um, and they would need to have a guardian appointed to basically assist that minor child in taking transfer of the property. The second problem is that the moment a minor is the registered owner of a property um, that he or she has inherited, um, he, the, the, the property cannot be sold and it cannot be uh, mortgaged without the consent. In some cases, it's the consent of the master and in some cases, it's the consent of the high court. So sibling C is now in the position where she luckily can still inherit. She will still get a half share in that property. The other half share will go to her minor niece or nephew, so her, her brother's child. But she is prevented from really doing anything with that property until that child reaches the age of majority. So she can't sell it. She can't raise money against it. You know, which is obviously quite a, a marked restriction on her rights as a property owner. Okay, Jess, you can move on. Okay, so just to summarize those, those cases that we've looked at, um, I think we can see the consequences are quite dire. The cohabiting partner, what we've learned is that they have no interstate rights at all. They will be completely excluded from inheriting. Similarly with a customary spouse, 
um, unless the family is prepared to cooperate or that spouse can, can in some way approve the marriage and have the marriage registered, uh, which incidentally it is possible to do after the death of the spouse, just with a little bit more difficulty. Um, again, unless she gets that cooperation or, or can, can provide that proof, she will also lose out um, in terms of intestate succession. The parent who marries, we've seen that children are always uh, behind a, su a surviving spouse when it comes to intestate succession, um, and that often a, a spouse can come in and just essentially kick out children who've lived in a property for, for their entire lives. The fourth one is this, this, these cases of, of disputes among the heirs. So we've seen that, that it's only a valid will, a proper, validly executed will that can give effect to the wishes of the deceased. No other type of document will do that. And without that, um, the, the consequences, you know, what the family had in mind is often very different to what the law says. And then with the minor heir, basically what we've seen is the, the it can really frustrate your, your rights as a property owner, as well as, you know, incur severe costs for you in, in appointing a guardian for the minor. Okay, so those are our case studies. I hope that's been interesting and, and of some benefit. Um, I think it gives quite a nice synopsis of the sort of problems that are encountered um, when somebody dies without a will. I mean, this is obviously just a snapshot. You have a, a myriad of other kinds of examples. Um, shall we move over to questions? Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask? Um, there's, I see a hand. Um, Pam, you can go ahead. Okay. Hi, Lisa. Thank Hi, you for this. Um, as you know, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> it's just so exhausted listening to these cases and just imagining <laughs> how, yeah, contentious these things are. Um, and also just, I mean, I don't know what your your perspective is because, uh, and I'm sure other people would also sort of back me up here. And I know this is a huge generalization, but it's it's pretty much true to some extent that we come from context where to discuss someone dying and a will and drafting of a will is almost like taboo. Um, and <laughs> um, it's just, I'm just trying to figure out how does one like a legal i mean we we have the sort of the law as you as you say it you know there's there's the difference between the intentions and what people would have said verbally even to family members but it, it transpires differently when you have to apply the law so yeah. there will it seems to me there will always be this tension and if you look at the target audience of who we work with if we're talking about bng units it's really people that I can uh, stereotype and say probably fall into that grouping of people who don't like to talk death and wheels while people are still alive. You know, uh, it's almost like, that's why there's always fights when people die after the funeral. But what I, it, yeah, I just wanted to get your take and maybe everyone's take on how do we navigate? I mean, what's, I don't even know if there's the best thing to do um, in this regard when we're handing over houses and at what point do we, um include this kind of information but what i want to point out as much as the scenarios deal with like sort of family sort of related uh issues what has intrigued me is also in cases where people have gone on to sell property informally and those who have bought are now suddenly dealing with you know people who they've never interacted with who are suddenly coming to claim their deceased parents' estates who, the, or properties that were sold without their knowledge. I think I've sent to Ilana one typical case of a, a mother who died uh, interstate with two very young children. And at the time, the siblings of the mother came in under the pretext of oh, that they were going to take care of these kids and decided that they were going to sell the property. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that sale was done informally. And it was really a bad case where these children ended up uh, were ill-treated, badly treated, and social workers had to be called in and eventually ended up staying, were adopted, no, were fostered by different families. Now that they are adults, they are actually going back to 
their mother's house and they want their mother's house back. And you're sitting now with someone who's bought this property informally a long time ago, more than 20 years ago, who faces some kind of eviction, possibly, from these children. So it's not just the family sort of, like the scenarios I think you've put up, there's some, sort of some direct link to the original beneficiary, if I can call it that, but the implications are quite huge. And there's, there's possibly cases that you will deal with if you haven't already, that fit categories of people who've gone on to sell properties informally. And I don't just don't know how you deal with that mess. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point you raised, Pamela. So, so just from a, from a cultural perspective, I mean, that's certainly been our experience. I mean, you can see from that initial pie graph how very few people have actually come to us to do a will. Um, and certainly from the example of Mrs. D, who, you know, was adamant she didn't want to do a will. She wanted to donate the property right now and get it done with. I definitely think there is a sort of a, a reluctance to have those discussions. Um, you know, if I just I think of the example of my own domestic worker. So she's a, a woman in her 50s who has a, an RDP house in Elita Park. So it's worth in excess of 600,000 rand. She has a son who's a little bit of a naughty, uh, naughty child. She's not particularly enamored with him. And then she has a daughter. And she said to me many, many times, she wants the property to go to the daughter and she, you know, the son can have her car and various other things. And I have been trying for the last two years to get her to do a will. And when I, and she's put, you know, batted me off and batted me off. And when I unpacked it with her, it's because she doesn't want to upset the family even after she's passed on. So she doesn't want what's expressed in her will which is obviously contrary to what culturally is acceptable, you know, that the property should go to her son. Um, she doesn't want to cause those fights amongst her family. So she would rather just leave it. She actually, she actually can't even have those discussions and sit them down and say, this is what I have decided and this is what I'm going to do. So I think you're completely correct. Um, we certainly haven't done enough work in our space. You know, when we do, when we get title deeds issued, whether it be on primary transfers or whether it be on these informal cash sales, we, we really should be a little bit stronger in our approach about almost insisting that you now do a will or, or strongly recommending that you now do a will. Um, and I think arising actually out of putting this presentation together, I think we need to do some work in that space. Um, you, you also mentioned, you know, whether there's some scope from, from human settlement side to, to have that discussion when handing over houses about the importance of a will. And I, and I definitely think there is, um, you know, we've put together some very nice, simple pamphlets, which could even just be, you know, handed out with title deeds kind of thing, um, to get that message across. Um, the issue you asked about the informal cash sales, yes, I mean, we have had many, 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 many hybrid cases, so informal cash sales from deceased estates, they are capable of resolution, but it's exactly the point you raise, which is, you now have a, a purchaser, an innocent purchaser, having to deal with family members, heirs, for starters, they often can't find the family members and heirs, um, you know, so the winding up of the, of those estates, following you know following straight into a cash sale it, it's complicated and it's unaffordable for most people um but that's a, a large part of the work that we're doing yeah thanks lisa and pam uh for you guys your hand is up next and then there's a question from lisa the after but for you guys you can go first thank you Thanks, Sam. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for these scenarios. They're quite very complicated and they really just show the importance of having a will. Um, mine is just from one of the scenarios, um, the parent um, who marries. So I wanted to know if, for example, if um, P's mother, if if they were if he if she and her partner were not married in community or in community of property would she have received that property her mother's property or oh, not okay yeah it's a very interesting question so basically um just to unpack it so the law of intestate succession right recognizes the rights of the surviving spouse whether you are married in community or out of community. So the surviving spouse of a, of a validly recognized marriage 
will still always get the first 250,000. The difference in P's scenario, remember, is if they had been married out of community of property, um, that asset wouldn't have been part of the joint estate, meaning it would only have been the mother's asset. So when the mother passed away, the mother's asset would have been dealt with purely as her own standalone asset, not, remember we looked at the value of her estate being the 313, because they were married in community, so they both shared both properties. If they were married out, her only asset would have been the her property of 244. And unfortunately, in this particular scenario, it would have had the same effect for P, because the first 250,000 Rand would have gone to the spouse, regardless of how they were married. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, it does. Thank you, Lisa. I think she's also asking if what if they were not married at all, but they had ah. they continued with their relationship somehow and ah. had kids, yeah. Yes, okay, that's a brilliant that that's a it's a really nice comparison. So were they not married at all? Um we've seen with a cohabiting partner. Um remember the law doesn't recognize a cohabiting partner. So in that case. The, the valid intestate is of P's mother would have been P and her half brother. So in that case, at least P would have been entitled to half her mother's property rather than just this, this 31,000 that she got left with at the end of the day. Thanks. Lisa, the other one, you, you keep saying that the cohabiting partner has no rights. Um, I think that's the first scenario. I don't know if you called it a... Yeah, a cohabiting partner has no rights uh, versus a even a, a, you made the distinction between a cohabiting partner and a sort of uh, married uh, with a what's it traditional hmm, customer. Yeah. But right. it's interesting to me because quite recently, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever heard this, but there's been quite a widespread belief based on a number of court cases that actually cohabiting with someone is very dangerous in that if you die, there's a potential that they would um, inherit something or some of your or, of your belongings. I don't know how true it is, but I, I, I know, at least in my circles, that there's a wide, uh, widely held belief um, that there have been a couple of, uh, of court cases that ruled in the favor of uh, cohabiting partners, where someone could demonstrate that they've lived with someone for a long time. It's still not regarded as a customary marriage that's separate, but just by virtue of cohabiting with someone for quite a number of of years, uh, it seems. And I, I don't have any court cases to to basically tell you about, but I do remember um, this has been quite a thing in the past couple of years. I don't know okay. if you know about that. Yeah, you're quite correct. There was quite a prominent case, I think it was sometime last year, maybe the year before, um, with a woman who had lived for a very long time um, with her partner in Camps Bay, he was very, very wealthy. Um, and it was it was quite controversial because, um, you know, she'd come from very lowly um, beginnings. Um, and it wasn't quite it wasn't quite clear, you know, whether she was unscrupulous or whether this was a valid relationship. The court did find um, in her favor in that case. But what's important to remember is that it's very, uh, there, there is no, there is no law which, which supports you in that. In other words, so what we have now is we have one case um, which has found in her, in her favor, which does open the door for possible, you know, uh, common law to be developed in that, in that regard. The other thing to remember is that, I mean, she went through, I don't know how many high court applications. So you've got to have a lot of cash behind you if you want to take it on, um, you know, which I think in this market is probably quite unlikely. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Pam, was your question answered? Yes, perfectly, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was a question from Judy in the chat box. Um, her mic, her speaker doesn't seem to be working and she just asked, can you confirm which case scenario will be used if you're married out of community of property with accrual and you own the property? She said she's not sure if this forms part when drawing up a will. Okay, great question. So remember, as we've discussed, the law of intestate succession recognizes the surviving spouse 
as being entitled to inherit the first 250, regardless of your type of marriage. So your rights to inherit are different to your rights, your proprietary consequences of your marriage as a result of what marriage regime you've chosen. So like, for example, in, out, out with a cruel, those are valid, um, particularly if you, for example, if you get divorced, it will determine what happens to property. Um, and also um, there's various other instances when it becomes applicable, but certainly the law of interstate succession still recognizes that the surviving spouse gets the first 250 regardless. Okay, so, you know, in that instance, remember, the only difference is going to be that you're going to look at the deceased's estate as his separate estate because you were married out of community. So there's going to be no joint estate. So you're looking at his state, let's for say, for example, his estate separately. Um, and the first 250 will still go to, to the surviving spouse because he, he died without a will. Um, and then thereafter, there are other rules about how the accrual in the estate works on the death of the, of the deceased. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. she, she said that's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, then we have Paul and Sezek. I'm not sure if you're still going to ask a question, Sezek, but Paul, you can ask your question. Uh, hi, Lisa. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, this is quite a technical question. I just wanted to understand it a bit more. It's about the Mrs. P. I mean, the P, the one with P, and I can't remember all the, all the other initials, but yeah, you said that was the most complicated thing. It's just um, uh, that, like you mentioned, if the, if, um, I can't remember what the mother's name is, but if the mother left the um, property to the, to her biological, I mean, to her daughter from that one, from the first marriage, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that would all be, uh, you know, that, that would lead to the outcome that they thought would, um, they would like. Um, but I, I'm just wondering of the technicalities of that, um, because it was a joint estate, she could only pass on her share of the joint state to her nominated uh, sort of heir. So then there was quite a complicated process um, because her part of her state only became kind of like liquidated upon her death, and then the other parts of her estates, which is locked up in in her husband's estate or whatever, I don't know if this is the case, would only become kind of active when when he died. Yes, um, yes if you can just so, go back to that slide um, yeah. where we where we showed um, on P's case what the outcome would have been. Are you still with us, Jess? Okay. I am. Let me know. Um, I think it's um, about slide 15 or something like that. See here, um, uh, this one? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you have a look at that scenario, um, you absolutely correct, um, Paul. Had um, P's mother done a will, um, she would actually only have been entitled to... to uh, vest her half share in the property but remember she also had a half share in her husband's property and as you've correctly pointed out um you know that kind of gets tied up until the husband passes away so in this in this case and i didn't want to over complicate it when i when i put the slides together but in this case where you married in community of property it's really uh, the, the wise thing to do to have a joint tool it doesn't make much sense to have a will dealing only with your half share because it's not really going to, to have the intended effect. So what they, what they should probably have done and what we would have advised them to do is that P and Mr. And P's mother and Mr. M do a joint will. They say that on the first dying of us, um, the property can be transferred to, to P. So when I say that if P's mother had a will, I actually mean a joint will. 
Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, I was just wondering what happens in that interim period. Like, how does the law handle that situation where um, the half, um, well, the, I, 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 yeah, I mean, these two properties are basically tied together in this joint estate, but like, would, so, I, I mean, they would, um, so would it just amount to the, um, uh, I can't, you know, I get mixed up with all these names, but anyway, the, the, the child, the daughter being, or I don't remember if it's a male or female, but anyway, the child being able to just claim, claim transfer of, of that property, would it amount to that or would they no, have to wait? No, so the, act the actual effect would be that she would be entitled to claim half the property on her mother's death and then uh, the other half would be transferred to her on, on Mr. M's death. So yeah. that's why we don't we don't really recommend that people divest their their joint estate assets in isolation. Mm -hmm. What usually happens, and what we would recommend, is we would say do a joint will. The usual scenario is that everything vests in the surviving spouse until that surviving spouse passes away. Mm -hmm. But with the proviso that when that surviving spouse passes away, the intention is that P gets you know, both shares in the month in that property, essentially. Mm. Yeah, mm. So that you can do because remember, you're doing it together as the joint uh, owners in the joint estate. Yeah, OK. All right, thanks. Yeah. But then um, in this case, I still think it's still sort of pretty much clear cut, Lisa, because there's only two children, um, you know, two belonging to the mother and sort of one to the deceased husband. The like, I mean, it's just a mess because you know other kids crop up at some point mm -hmm. <laughs> into this thing, and I'm just thinking about even how having, I mean, having a will. It seems it sorts one aspect or one potential problem, but it's you're still facing a situation where someone's child crops up from nowhere, and it just complicates the things even further. Am I right? Absolutely. Look, I mean, life is always going to happen. You know, we've had cases where clients have come to us and said, I'm the only child of, of my mother. My mother's passed away. I would like to have the property transferred to me. And when we report the estate at the master, the master tells us, oh, no, there are three other children. And she had no idea. So, you know, yes, I understand your point, which is that how far does a will really take it? But the point is it does, because... You know, in that case, had her mother done a will to say, I want to leave the property to my daughter, X, um, even if these other siblings had, had come out of the woodwork, um, that's fine. They can come out of the woodwork and they ask for her children, but they don't inherit in terms of the will. Without a will, you're now looking at a scenario where you have three siblings you didn't know about, and now how are you going to sort it out? So, yeah, so a will, I mean, it really does, it is really clear cut. The other, you know, the other thing about if we go back to the P example very quickly, it's, it's, it's as I said, it's a cost issue as well, because, you know, you're doing one transfer, let's say, from a deceased mother to her child, rather than these series of estate transfers that need to happen according to the laws of intestate succession. You know, because when you don't have a will, you have to transfer according to what the law says. And that is first to surviving spouse, then to, you know, children, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have to actually have sequential conveyancing transactions. And that is just, well, number one, it's time consuming and also it's just very expensive. Is there anyone else asking a question? Because I have another one. Um, <laughs> I love scenarios. Uh, no one. Okay. Can I go, um, Lisa? Yes, sure. So I just want to ask now in terms of uh, siblings inheriting from their siblings' estate, like a, 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 a case that just cropped up in my mind now. So we've, I've got a sort of a, a relative um, married um, to someone and both of them have never had children. So they lived happily ever after kind of scenario, but no children from both sides. But then the husband dies first uh, due to COVID. And then 
sadly, after his funeral, I think about 14 days later, the wife follows, who happens to be an aunt. And <laughs> this has like brought in a very interesting com uh, conflict now because, you know, it's a question of which family has a right to inherit. Yes. In that context. Uh, and remember that the, the husband died first and then there are no children there. And then a few days later, the wife passed away. So there's a whole huge dispute between the family and, and siblings of both uh, basically arguing over who should inherit the property. Okay, now I'm glad you raised that because there is there, there's a, a common, I think a common misperception that you can inherit from your siblings. And that is true and also not true. So where the, what the law of interstate succession says is if you die and you have no spouse and you have no children. So remember in your scenario, the husband died first, meaning everything will go to the spouse correct? The moment this, the, the wife dies, she is now dying. So she has the entire joint estate. She's now dying without a spouse and without children. So what the law says is that your heirs are then your parents, okay? If your parents have passed on before you, only then do you look at the descendants of your parents. Because remember, intestate succession likes to go down the line. It likes to follow each branch of heir down the line. So let's say you had a scenario where, where this husband and wife have passed away. Um, remember the husband's estate, I think we can essentially say is almost irrelevant because depending on the on the value of that, of that property, um, let's just say it's under 500,000, meaning the, the, the wife would get the, the 250 share, meaning that the property would essentially be vested in the wife. So we can essentially ignore the husband's estate, depending on the property value. Um, we then need to look at the wife's estate. No spouse, no children, her parents are her valid heirs. If one parent is still alive, then that parent inherits, and the descendants of the other parent, so in other words, essentially siblings of the deceased, will be the other heirs. So that is how it works. And if both parents have already predeceased uh, the wife, then both of their shares will divest on, on their descendants, being the brothers and sisters of the deceased. Of the wife. Of the wife, yes. Look, I'm saying this assuming the property is valued at 500 yeah. 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 OK, thanks. That's really a nightmare, these things. Um... Yeah, it's just, it's one of those things with funerals. It's just like a whole post-mortem after that. Yeah. of fighting each other over this thing. Absolutely. And you now have a scenario where, I mean, essentially they died at the same time. And yet the law will say that the husband's family, you know, I'm sorry, he died first. It goes to the wife. The husband's family doesn't really have a say, which is maybe not fair, you know, if you look at it like that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I guess it. I, I don't know. It brings me back to the question of what. What do we? What's the best thing to do for us and our beneficiaries without really wanting to take agency away from people? Um, you know. But I. I do get a sense that we. I think we. We. We all, uh, including myself, don't know how these things work, and I don't know what's the best thing we can do for the beneficiaries that we hand over these properties to. Um, because I was saying even to Jackie and, and the team when we were preparing for this, because the department wanted to do its own sort of wheels uh, day kind of thing or week. And I just, you know, all of us have always have this week in September where we know, you know, you've got a potential of doing your will for free, but people don't actively do it because it means nothing until they hear scenarios that, um, relate to them or that they can identify with and where they can see the potential issues because there are a lot of single mothers who either have cohabiting partners and they don't think of anything you know to it and they don't realize you know even when people remarry with one child uh, that they had they don't realize what the implications could be for the child that they brought into marriage so until people hear of the scenarios and and see how it could impact impact them. They just really don't bother. 
you know, mm-hmm. or there's an assumption like of that grandmother who wanted in her head, she was going to leave this property in the adopted child's, you know, uh, to the adopted child and, and overlook the biological child. And so many people have these ideas around how to pass on, you know, their properties after death or yeah, their estate. So I just, I'm stuck again at what's the most responsible thing we can do without taking away people's sort of agency and mm. and rights. At what point do we intervene? I think that's exactly it. I think, you know, it's very difficult to, to get people to understand the, the kind of problems you could run into unless you actually sit and look at these cases or you know somebody who's had a similar case. And, you know, that's why we're sort of trying to think of ways to, to get this message out. Um, and perhaps, Pamela, maybe we must have a, you know, like a brainstorming session where we can give you some of our information and, and we can look at, at how best you get that message across to your beneficiaries. Thanks. I see for Shane. Uh, there's um, hands. There's, so Le, uh, Lynette has a question in the in the chat box as well. Um, Paul, I'm not sure if that's an old end. Um, and then Prishain's hand is also up. So I think let's just first go with Lynette. Yes, um, that's the next question. She's asking yes. if the father died in test state and the mother was pregnant at the time with, with their third child. Does the unborn child have the same rights to inherit from the father? And the answer is yes. Yeah, so it's children born and unborn usually is the assumption. Um, you know, unless anybody's going to maybe dispute paternity of that child, but yes, um, children born and unborn. And there's a second part to a question with regard to whether there'll be pro bono lawyers at the master's office during World's Week to assist clients with a low income this year. Yeah, look, World's Week was last week. Um, so that's come and gone. Um, as far as I know, I think that is it. Um, but you know, we are always a resource uh, for referrals um, for for wills. We also do them for nothing. Um, and pro bono as an organisation um, also offers that service. So that's another another reference point for clients. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Paul. Uh, do you still have another question or is it the old end? Uh, no, it's a new hand, but I mean, it can be rhetorical. Um, it's just, I'm just wondering where does interstate law come from? Um, and is it kind of more or less the same across the world? Has anyone tried to rewrite interstate law or are there other principles um, that may be more um fairer um just a, a question i um yeah and i don't know what the, i don't know if there's an easy answer probably there isn't a very easy answer but i just thought it's something to think about anyway mm-hmm. yeah in a nutshell the answer is no it's not the same all over the world so remember different countries different jurisdictions have different laws some are english laws some are roman dutch law so your law develops as a result of hundreds and thousands of years of of precedent, basically. So no, it won't be the same all over the world. Can I just smuggle one question on that, Lisa? Sorry, on Paul's one. Is so it does it matter where one was married? Because we're talking cases where people have been married and whether one dies where. So which law supersedes one? And I'm like very interested in this one for obvious reasons <laughs> <laughs> that's very interesting so basically what what south african law says is that your marriage is determined that, so the rules governing the proprietary consequences of your marriage are governed by your husband's domicile at the time of your marriage um unless of course you enter into a, a an anti-nuptial contract that says something else so you can always contract your own um, cons- propriety consequences of your marriage within, um, you know, certain guidelines. But if you don't, like, for example, if you get married in South Africa you autom- and you don't do an anti-nuptial contract, you're automatically married in community of property. Um, if your husband happened to be domiciled and domiciled, remember, is 
where your intention is to reside. So you must have the intention of residing there and not moving anywhere else indefinitely. Um, so for example, I mean, my husband, for example, is Belgian, but is domiciled in South Africa. So, you know, has no intention of living in South Af in Belgium, returning to Belgium, his domicile is South Africa. So therefore your marriage would be governed by the laws of South Africa. It actually doesn't um, matter for interstate succession. Remember we said that the interstate success succession uh, rules um, or recognize the, the surviving spouse regardless of what proprietary regime you've chosen for your marriage. So that actually, it actually becomes irrelevant to some extent. Okay, thanks. Uh, appreciate you on next, then we'll have Yvonne and Colin after that. Thanks folks. Uh, two quick quest questions, Lisa. Thanks for the presentation. I did a quick little bit of research and saw that um, you had an open day on Saturday that passed in Kailicha together with Smith Tabata. Um, very good initiative. I was just wondering whether you have any intentions to have something like that again in the area by any chance. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly, as I've said, we, we, we acknowledge that we probably haven't done enough work to push wills amongst our, both amongst our existing clients and amongst, you know, the community in general. Um, I think we're always open to that. We've got nothing specific planned at this point in time. Um, you know, the question is always how to sort of garner support for these kind of community days. So we did have um, we did have this community day, um, a whole sort of team of lawyers from STBB were there. Um, and unfortunately, the turnout was very poor. I mean, we only had about six or seven clients actually come in over that three hour period to actually sign wills. And then about six or seven more that didn't sign wills, but were given some um, estate planning advice and will hopefully sign wills, uh, you know, in the future. Um, so that is always, you know, as we've discussed, the, the problem is how to, to get people to trust the process, to trust, you know, the, the, the very concept of a will and etc. But we are always open to, to, to pushing that message and to having further kind of events like that. Noted. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, the second one is when a will or a person passes away and if the will is in place, etc., etc., and let's say the entire world and the estate is is wound up now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm led to believe that there's a there's a bit of a fee that either the executor or the conveyancer, I'm not sure, takes from the estate at around three and a half percent or something like that. Is this the norm? And is there what's what's been your experience on it? Are there have, have, especially for people in um, you know, low income category category groups like our beneficiaries. Yeah, so uh, there are two categories of deceased estates. Um, they are the what's called the 18-3 estates, where your total estate value is 250,000 rand or less. Those are dealt with in terms of a much simplified process, um, whereby you don't pay that three and a half percent fee you basically get appointed, some, somebody gets appointed as a master's representative and is given fairly broad powers to just wind up the estate without the intervention of a, of a professional. So whether that's an accountant or a lawyer or, or somebody, you know, professional. Um, then you get the estates that are over 250,000 Rand. And those estates in terms of that legislation, yes, your executor is entitled to charge three and a half percent plus that of the value of the estate to wind up. And we know that that is prohibitively, for, for, you know, prohibitive for, for clients in this market. You know, if you just look at um, P's example, because there were two properties that pushed the joint estate over 600,000, uh, each, each spouse's estate is essentially 313, meaning both of those estates have become big estates, estates over 250. Both of those estates will actually um, incur that 3.5%. So you're doing that twice just to give effect to, to something that was probably discussed amongst the family in any event. We have done quite a lot of work 
So that 250,000 rand threshold is set by the, by the Minister of Justice and it hasn't been increased for many, many, many years. And we believe that that threshold is now too low. You know, with the, the um, sort of uh, appreciation in property values, it, you know, even in the RDP and the BNG markets, um, the, that 250,000 rand threshold is just too low. You cannot, these types of, of clients are maybe asset rich, you know, they might have a, a house worth 380,000 rand, but they might most likely unemployed. unemployed. So you, you can't sort of look at somebody and say, well, just because your state is worth 380, um, you can afford to pay three and a half percent executor's fees. Uh, I don't believe that, that you can. So we've done quite a lot of work in trying to put pressure on the Minister of Justice to raise that threshold. Um, and unfortunately, I've been shot down at this stage. Um, there is there isn't a planned overhaul of the entire administration of estates act and we've been kind of battered off with the the um, advice that when they overhaul the administration of estates act they'll kind of look at this threshold etc cetera, etc cetera. um but yes i mean certainly that cost is prohibitive thanks thanks lisa yvonne okay thank you samantha uh, Lisa, it's just an extension to Lynette's question, the unborn baby. Say now uh, Mr. M passes on, and this is his only uh, a child, which was conceived, to say, a day before he dies. And then we are so quick in our communities to run and wind up the estate. What happens if the process has been uh, finalized? Now, after nine months, here comes baby Y. Uh, what happens in that scenario? Okay, as I always like to say to clients, you know, nothing that is done cannot be undone. So let's say you have a scenario where, um, uh, you know, somebody passes away and leaves two children born and one children unborn, um, one child unborn. Let's say by some miracle that estate was quickly wound up and the property transferred to those other two children. Um, if you sort of arise as a valid intestate after the fact, it's not to say that you can't um, bring application to have your share transferred to you. So, you know, once the property is, is in somebody's name, that's not to say that there isn't room for correction or, or rectification of, of what has happened. It depends on the size of the estate again. Remember, if it's, if it's a large estate and it's over the 250 threshold, it's a little bit more of a complicated process because it's got to go back to the master and the master's, you know, a new liquidation account's got to be drawn up and it's got to be advertised and, and it's quite an extensive process. But if it's a, a smaller state, it's actually a fairly simple process. You know, you come along and you and you show who you are and you and that you have, have a claim as an intestate heir, and and basically that corrective transfer can be done to take cognizance of that third child. Colin, do you want to go next? Yeah. Thank, thanks. Um... Samantha. Um, hi, Lisa. Thanks for your information session. It's very useful. Um, just a question. A family member um, see, um, so was married, um, passed on, and she made 50% um, of, of, of a portion of the, of the estate to uh, two children, of surviving children. Um, the husband, um, he wanted to sell the house at that and that stage, and they came to an agreement that um, the portion that the mother made to them, um, they will uh, use, and then they will pay out their father for the um, his his um, uh, portion of the of the estate. And um, in the meantime, um, uh, he got remarried, and he recently passed on um i think he was married in community of property with with his second wife i just wanted to know the the children was in the process of paying him out so they there's a still an outstanding amount uh, due to what it was due to him um does does the children automatically um now has to pay that amount to his um 
his uh, recent wife? Okay, it's a it's quite a complicated question you're asking, um, because there are various rules um, about which contracts an executor in a deceased estate has to honour and which he has the power to set aside. So I would have to just refresh my memory on. A, so I mean, if there's nothing in writing between those children and their deceased father about this arrangement to buy out his half share um, and sort of proof of funds that have transferred hands and things like that, then they don't stand a hope in hell on actually having that arrangement honored. Um, if there is, as I said, I'd have to refresh my memory as to which, um, exactly which contracts the executor needs to abide by. If, it, if a sale of immovable property is one of those that the executor needs to abide by, and if there is proof, then it's fine. Then basically what they will have to do is, is pay to the estate. So they don't pay to the spouse directly. They pay to the estate. Um, and the executor is the person who is responsible for then determining, you know, what how that gets distributed. Because remember, that's only one aspect of the estate. Um, just to answer your question, though, I mean, assuming that they cannot prove that there was this arrangement between them and their father to buy out his half share, remember in law, um, the moment he passes away and he hasn't done a will, and assuming there is no proof of this arrangement, his spouse, his new spouse, inherits his half share. So they are in a bit of a pickle. I'm sorry, so, so just for understanding, so it's important that they have the proof or um, the, the agreement between the, the, the father and the children. And um, just um, understanding um, in, uh, how will his new wife be able to claim um, his person um, of, of his, his, his previous estate? Well, remember, um, by virtue of their marriage, she is automatically, the moment they got married, right, she is automatically a half share owner in his half share. So that is already hers. So nobody can touch that. So what's essentially left is his half share of his of the half share. And that is she automatically inherits by virtue of the fact that she's the surviving spouse. So actually she has a claim to his entire half share of the property. And I mean, how she, how she actually physically gets that will depend on the size of the estate, you know, whether it goes to an executor and it gets done in a liquidation account and formally through the master's office or whether it gets done informally according to this, this easier process. It really depends on the value of the estate. Okay, thank thanks so much. Eh? Yeah. I don't see any further questions. Um, and if there aren't any further questions, I will hand over to Yvonne to close our session. Okay, thank you so much, Samantha. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, to the colleagues from TSC, Lisa, Jessica, I'm not sure whether Ilana was sharing uh, the laptop with Jessica, but I would like to say if I had the powers from uh, the department, since my two, uh, two directors are here, I cannot say on behalf of the department, so I would rather stick to on behalf of knowledge management as a unit and the colleagues who assisted in terms of having this show going would like to say just two few words that we normally shy away from it's thank you that's what i've been sent to say that thank you for the time that we have spent behind uh, the scenes where you went through preparing it wasn't just the presentation but the different scenarios that you have shared with us which make everything practical for all of us to understand so we would like to say thank you for that and then to the colleagues from policy and research who made sure that, that this becomes reality, the engagements, a uh, few meetings that you had so that we can have this session today. We would like to say
say as knowledge management, thank you for the collaboration that we have. And also not just bringing a topic, but you ensured that we speak exactly to the mandate of the department where we say we are promoting livable neighborhoods. What do I mean by that? Just to say where there is a will, we have this uh, uh, idea of having a peaceful life. And to the colleagues from knowledge management who ensure that this, the, the facilitation goes through, would like to say thank you and your work doesn't go unnoticed. To the colleagues within the department, you had other things to do, but you chose to be here today. And without you, we wouldn't have had this session because without the listeners or the audience who will conceive this uh, message across, I mean, this message coming from the colleagues, it, it would have been a fruitless uh, exercise. So thank you so much and God bless you. Bye. I guess this is when you say thank you and goodbye. <laughs> I, I forgot that I had the power to say uh, this session is urgent. Thank you so much, Colleen. Thank, so thank, 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 thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Samantha. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Thanks, Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you